I'm Alan Mortis, and this is Think Radio Presents Think Business. My guest today is entrepreneur Krista Powers. So my childhood, you couldn't keep me out of the trees. Okay, so when it was not sugaring season, I was climbing up those trees. I would like climb to the tippy top of them mm. and terrify my mom, I'm sure. Oh, it's, it's a kid's job. <laughs> Welcome to another great conversation on Think Radio. Think Business is made possible by funding from the Ice Lab at Western, supporting innovative business in the rural Southwest. If you like Think Business, then I know you'll enjoy the other shows in the Think Radio Presents family of podcasts. Think People, a celebration of just how amazing people can be. Think Planet, conversations with thought leaders on important environmental issues. Subscribe to Think Radio Presents on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else you get great content. And don't forget to help us spread the word by liking our social media channels and sharing the content we post. We're grateful to have you in the conversation on Think Radio Presents. My guest today is entrepreneur Krista Powers. Krista is the founder and owner of a company with the clever and descriptive name Vermont Sticky. That's because Powers is in the maple syrup business. In fact, she's the third generation in her family to practice the art and craft of sugaring. But I think that description is a little too limiting because, in fact, Vermont Sticky provides a wide range of products derived from maple sugar that are 100% organic and do a lot more than just top your pancakes at breakfast. Her vision, following a long family tradition, is to create natural, healthy alternative sweeteners, something the world could definitely use. So, Krista, thanks for joining me today. I look forward to the conversation. Alan, thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. You know, when I think of maple syrup, I have to go back to my childhood. Not because I grew up in the Northeast, but the opposite. I grew up in South Texas, Mm -hmm. okay, where the only trees we had were mesquite trees, <laughs> right? I don't know if you've ever seen a mesquite tree, but it's all thorns and tiny little mm. uh, leaves and, and just not what you would call appetizing in any way, shape, or form. Sure. So we would see commercials on TV for maple syrup and people getting maple syrup out of these luscious forests, and it mm-hmm. just seemed so incredibly romantic. You grew up in that tradition. How did it feel to be a child on that end? Well, Alan, so my childhood, you couldn't keep me out of the trees. Okay, so when it was not sugaring season, I was climbing up those trees. I would, like, climb to the tippy top of them Hmm. and terrify my mom, I'm sure. Oh, it's it's a kid's job. (laughs) Um, And then in the fall, we were always um, harvesting our, our firewood, not only to heat our house, but also for sugaring season, because mm-hmm. it was all wood fired. So we would cut 40 cord of wood. 40? Uh-huh. So I was in and amongst those maple trees and other, I mean, the East Coast has such a diversity of trees. So I would just grew up in the trees. And then all <laughs> sugaring season, even before I was big enough to carry the sap bucket. So traditionally, um, you had like a a five-gallon bucket, and we would take those five-gallon buckets from tree to tree and gather the sap that had collected in like a one-gallon bucket. Mm -hmm. So you might be able to go to, you know, a handful of trees and fill up your five-gallon buckets and then go back over to... um, like the holding tank, holding tank, which mm. was being pulled by mm. like our, well, traditionally it was horses, right? And and um, then a tractor. Uh, so before I was big enough to be able to carry those buckets, my dad had me driving the tractor. The tractor, okay. I was, I swear, knee high to a grasshopper. And my dad was like, well, here you go. You're going to learn how to drive the tractor. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Well, so see, you're not doing anything at all to dispel my idea that this was a pretty cool childhood, right? Yeah, I mean, I learned how to work hard. I learned like the value behind that. Um, I also was carrying on a tradition that my grandfather started, and my dad was he my my grandfather died when I was pretty young, but my dad fully embraced sugaring season and was involved with um, the Sugar Maple Association and kind of helped pioneer some new technologies. And um, there's like a, a lot of research that's even still today being done through the University of Vermont um, and the Sugar Makers mm -hmm. Association. So yeah, he's been very involved with that. and. Cool. But well, I can't say that it was all romantic. Well, no, nothing ever is. <laughs> but, I mean, remember, we're talking about mesquite trees here. There's <laughs> absolutely nothing romantic about a mesquite tree, so uh -huh. you're ahead of me still. <laughs> Which parts would you say were not romantic? Well, I would say those cold days. Because sugaring season is when? Sugaring season happens in the spring. So if you've ever been to the Northeast in the spring, you know that one day it could rain and the next day it could snow mm -hmm. or even throughout the day it can change back and forth and it's damp and it's cold and you're walking through like mud and mm -hmm. really um melty snow you know so you were we were wet and cold somehow making those five gallon buckets even heavier i would think absolutely <laughs> <laughs> Well, so talk to us a little bit about the tradition of maple syruping. We'll get to all of those technological innovations in a minute and yeah. why, why today it's a business that has real potential, yeah. even, even on the scale that you're practicing it. But the tradition of, of sugaring maple trees. Yeah, so I can share with you what I know, yeah. and that dates back long before my family. This goes back to the days when Native Americans were collecting. So they would um, you know, put a little slash in the tree and then collect that spring sap um, and then naturally let it evaporate because um, mm -hmm. it comes out of the tree mostly as water. Mm. So it comes out only like two and a half to three percent sugar. I see. So, so you wouldn't put that straight on your pancakes. No, it, it would be like putting water, yeah. <laughs> like a mildly sweet water on your pancake. So, yeah, most people think that it's already coming out as syrup and it's not. Yeah. It's um, like a sweet water uh -huh. kind of thing. So the Native Americans would collect that sap and then it would evaporate and what was left was like a, a sugar, a granular. Or it was it's actually kind of like in chunks. Mm. Right? Like So um, all the water is gone now and it's Yeah. And it would be like kind of chunky or crystals. Yeah. It's actually very pretty if you just let it like naturally go to like this crystal form. Yeah. Yeah. And then they use that in cooking and also as a trade commodity. So Huh. Well, yeah. of course. I mean, yeah. th that would be very valuable. Definitely. Yep. So where, how did we get from that then to what we think of, in this culture at least, as maple syrup? Sure. Well, let's take that um, to more modern times. And, and I say that um, even being like when my grandfather was young. Okay. So mm -hmm. they still were using it to for cooking right and then also as a trade commodity so um in the northeast it was mostly farmers and what are you doing in the winter well you're certainly not farming like you're, the you're fields. waiting to farm <laughs> yeah exactly so springtime um they would do the same thing collect the sap with you know uh, horses would pull a sleigh and then they would just do an open air so they you know maybe had a little sugar shack or or not but they were just you know boiling this down sometimes mm -hmm. open air over an open fire um and then again collecting that and using it for cooking throughout the season or throughout the whole year you know um and then would also barter you know with their neighbors or mm -hmm. beyond mm -hmm. so that was the next step right and then I it's would say the basis of a whole economy then. <laughs> it was all I mean you have to be creative and 
yeah. innovative and you kind of just make it work, right? And <laughs> Well, that sounds like entrepreneurism right? itself, whatever you're doing. <laughs> exactly. Um, I would say the next sort of phase came in maybe when I was young or somewhere in between like when my dad was young and when I was young. So mm -hmm. just a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, not bad, Come on. Um, but the the technology started to change. So there um, the processing of the syrup there um, started to become more innovation around it. So you could collect the sap a little bit easier. You could process that so you're just reducing it right that's the only thing you do to it is mm -hmm. just um, boil it down uh, so that process started to see some innovation um, and then there was the introduction to the tubes that kind of um, marry all the trees together as like this one unit mm -hmm. and then the sap flows from like a small tube into a bigger tube it's all like gravity fed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then into a holding tank. So So the five gallon bucket is gone. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. So it made things a little more convenient. Uh -huh. um, and so you could just get to more trees like within a certain period of time. Right. Yeah. Well, at what play at what type point in this whole process did the pancake arrive? Cuz I'm thinking about maple syrup it's one of those things that just pairs in your mind immediately. Maple mm -hmm. syrup goes on a pancake. Right. When, when did that when? become sort of the, because I, I almost suspect that that's a marketing. You got it. Uh, innovation more than anything. Well, I think when it, did that happen? yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you exactly the point, but I can take my best stab at it. Mm -hmm. um, so think about what was accessible back in the day you had Flour was pretty cheap, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you were using flour. Eggs were pretty right cheap, and door, everyone had are. them, right? Yeah. So then you started, like, you know, making different versions of bread, and pancake is just one of those versions of mm -hmm. bread. Mm -hmm. And then you had this product, such as maple syrup, mm -hmm. that was also accessible because you're making it yourself. Like, every little farmer out there was making it. And so why wouldn't you combine the two? And then the, as the industry grew, it was like, well, yeah, these pancakes, it's delicious. And here's a marketing tool, just yeah. organic marketing tool, right? Yeah, very much. Yeah, and I'm trying to say, like, it's so much more, as you mentioned earlier, than just for your pancakes or your waffles. Well, and that's why I bring yeah. that up, because yeah. we've got this long tradition of association, mm -hmm. maple syrup and pancakes, and uh, you're coming along and saying, hold the phone. There's a whole lot more to that. Mm -hmm. um, where'd you get that idea? Why not just ride that train? Well, I would say for my whole life, we've been using maple syrup as a sweetener, a household sweetener, right? So In your family. In my family, mm -hmm. yep. Um, in all sorts of different recipes. And it was just like, if a recipe called for sugar, we would use syrup. Makes um, sense. Yeah, it was there. We had it, and it's delicious. Um, I didn't know all the healthier benefits around it, right? Like all the – there's over 65 antioxidants, for example, and lots of minerals in it naturally occurring that our bodies need. And I didn't know any of that. I just knew that it tasted amazing, mm -hmm. and we would use it. So um, that was just easy for me. I always did it. Well, I've, let me back up. I was always like a semi-competitive to competitive athlete, like from really young age. And taking that to when I moved here, now almost 20 years ago, um, I just continued that. I was you know, participating in mountain bike races and um, like 24-hour mountain bike races and the Grand Traverse and Nordic races and <laughs> just kind of... So hardcore... <laughs> Taxing, physically taxing races. We're yeah. Not, we're not talking about mild athleticism here. Yeah, I was going out for 12 hours a day training or whatever it be. And so I got sucked into all the 
products that you can buy to give you energy and boost your experience when you're out on your Uh adventure. And I didn't love any of them. And so one day I just took a little bottle that I had and put maple syrup and salt in that bottle. And it was amazing. No more tummy ache, no more like film left on my tongue, Mm. no more just nastiness. I was like, this is awesome. (laughs) And so from there, I started playing around with different, um, adding like chocolate to it or adding raspberry. Yeah. To it. Well, but let's back up. This okay. this idea of adding salt to this to the maple syrup was that an original idea, or had yeah. you seen that done before? You just were like, I'm going to give this a try. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like salted car- caramel, right? It's delicious. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, no, it's um, it just happened. I mean, I know that being athletic and sweating, that I need salt, uh-huh. right? I need to replace those electrolytes. Uh-huh. So it was just an easy sort of thought or transition i was like oh i'm just gonna take maple syrup and add some salt to it and but that's not an idea you got from your grandfather or your father no No. this is this is your addition to the tradition yeah so kind of yeah taking my grandfather and father's sort of them paving the way for me to continue on the tradition but with my own spin yeah yeah okay so you started adding other things yep what happened then? Did you start sharing it around and saying, hey, you really got to try this? Yeah, I would just have it in my little container out on whatever adventure. And a friend would p- pull out a goo packet or whatever it was. And I'm like, oh, try this. And that just sort of spurred, right? It just started spiraling. And people were like, can I have some? Will you make <laughs> me some? And so I just would. I would just mix uh-huh. it up for my friends and give it away. And then eventually that kind of turned into something bigger. Well, okay. As good ideas do, they frequently catch on, right? Mm -hmm. Because they work Mm -hmm. and people like it. But it ends there for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You have a great idea. You go into your kitchen or your garage or your work shed or wherever you are. You, You make a few. It's cool. But that doesn't mean it's going to grow into a business. Describe the process of going from you're making this in little bottles for the trail to, no, wait a minute, we could actually do this commercially. How'd how'd you get from point A to point B there? Yeah. So it goes back to the tradition of sugaring season and, and making maple syrup, right? So I go back to Vermont each spring and work with my family, my dad, my cousins, aunt and uncle, Um, my mom, all these folks, uh, we all kind of come together, all hands on deck. Um, And so over the course of a number of years, I had been talking to my husband and my dad about selling maple syrup around Colorado, around Crested Butte, because my dad had been spoiling all my friends and me um, by driving a truckload out, and then that was our gifts to everybody (laughs) we would just like give maple syrup away for holiday gifts or birthdays or just to say thanks and um yeah then that sort of parlayed into more friends saying hey i hear your dad's coming out with a truckload of (laughs) maple syrup (laughs) your dad's a maple syrup dealer (laughs) he is he slings the sticky (laughs) it's classic i mean you bring it out you give it away for free Uh and then next thing you know get him hooked yeah Uh, yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) um so over the course of a couple of years of you know being in vermont and sort of talking to my dad and my husband and I was sort of in a position um, I had been in the valley for 15 16 years and you know pulling the three jobs and it's what you do in in resort communities and in mountain towns yeah yeah Um, so with the encouragement of of especially my husband and my father they were like why don't you just try it and see how it goes, see how it goes selling our maple syrup out here. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I did in 2016. I founded Vermont Sticky as a Colorado based business, which I'm really psyched about that it's, you know, I hope to bring, um, you know, jobs to the valley and in our community that I love so much here. Mm-hmm. So 
it's a Colorado-based business, and um, I just started right there with the maple syrup base. And then from there is when um, I started branching out. I mean, I'm <laughs> I am the ideas girl, so I'm always coming up with different ideas, and and especially like in the kitchen, coming up with different ideas of how to use different maple products. Well, okay, so give us uh, a couple of examples of your wildest ideas in the kitchen with maple syrup. Yeah, okay, and you want to hear my latest? Yes. This was on mm, Sunday, and today is Friday, so literally less than a week. So you're hearing it for the very first time mm -hmm. right here, right, right now. Right here, right now, and it is phenomenal. I should have brought you some. <laughs> I think that's true also. <laughs> So um, I'm calling it Maple Bites. If you can think of a maple Reese's Pieces. Oh, you got me already. Yeah. It's kind of like that, but it's... So is there peanut butter in it? Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah. So I have a couple different versions. One is kind of like um, a maple nougat. So if you can think, everyone knows what a nougat is, right? Yeah, it's like yeah. Three Musketeers. Yeah, kind of that sort of consistency of mm -hmm. maple. And then um, one version is mixing it just with uh, peanuts, so like chopped up peanuts. Uh -huh. um, another version is mixing it with chopped up cashews, which you could do this with like any <laughs> nut, right? Anything you wanted. Um, and then I ran out of both the peanuts and the cashews, but I still wanted this yumminess, so I just grabbed the jar of peanut butter. Yep. And I like mixed it all together, sprinkled some salt over the top of it, mixed in some some uh, chocolate chips, and voila. okay, you need to stop now because maple bites. Because the fact is, you didn't bring any, and so now I don't want to hear anymore. <laughs> um, I promise uh, I'll bring you some. That sounds amazing, and so you've actually made these now. Yeah. Okay, so now that sounds really traditional. Have you ever made a pairing with maple syrup that at first everyone goes what? Oh, for sure. So the one thing that that people give me that look uh -huh. and ask me about is when I mix up a maple, a Vermont sticky maple um, margarita. I get that yeah. look. Like I I'm giving you that look now. Mm -hmm. Really? It's delicious. So okay, so we'll have to try one of those too. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's instead of any kind of simple syrup that you would mix in a cocktail, it's great. And so let's not forget that a big benefit of what we're talking about here is that these products are organic. They're not processed in the sense that a lot of things are nope. that we get on the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So not only could you have a, a delicious margarita, but you get to know that this is not harmful in the way that some food products these days, regrettably, it's sad to say but it's true some food products are not exactly healthy but these are um tell us why you mentioned earlier so 65 antioxidants and that sort of thing what is it about maple syrup that makes such a good alternative to sweeteners yeah so let's address the bigger issue right and so that issue is that the average u.s person is consuming 130 pounds of refined sugar a year. Wow. Yeah, 130 pounds on average. And and that equates to about 39 teaspoons of refined sugar a day. Yeah, that's a third of a pound. Isn't that crazy? Okay. Okay, so, so that's that's the problem in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um so I'm telling you all this and and saying Vermont syrup or Vermont sticky or or maple syrup in general is healthier and yes it is but i would say consume responsibly <laughs> <laughs> right so we all have to take into consideration what we're putting in, in our bodies sure and um it is still a sweetener so it has calories but yeah our bodies need calories and, and our bodies need sugar sugar is energy and energy is calories mm -hmm. so it's not all bad as long as we're being cognizant of what we're eating mm -hmm. um, i don't want to say that it's like gonna solve all your health problems but if you're gonna eat a sugar as far as I know there's not a healthier one out there and I know honey has like a lot of 
health benefits. Maple has even more, and it's lower on the glycemic index, which means it's like a longer source of energy. Mm -hmm. um, so it just gives you a, uh, instead of that spike that you right, get from refined a, sugar, it gives you a longer. Which would be very important for athletes. I mean, that's where you started, was finding something that yes. could provide that energy. So here you are, you've, you feel like you've got this thing in your hands, this potential, for everything from pancake syrup, what we yeah. all associate with maple, to maple bites, mm -hmm. you know, Reese's Pieces with maple, and you started a business. How did it go? It's so fun. I feel so lucky. So in the same breath, it's terrifying, and it's a lot of work, um, but I still feel so lucky. What's terrifying about it? Um, okay, so I know how to make maple syrup, and I feel confident in, in knowing how to do that, even though I'm still learning every day when I'm back east. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a little girl driving area. the tractor. You've been right. at this a long time. You've got some expertise. <laughs> but I don't know anything about the food industry and how to break into that world. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a world that's controlled by big business. Mm -hmm. um, they set the standards for how your product goes into a store, um, how it's packaged, how the distribution works, and the nuances are um, outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> so a really intense learning curve. Yeah. Yep. Um, even like social media or web design or, I mean, you name it. Like, I don't know yeah. how to do any of these, but I still feel like I have this very broad brush knowledge of how to do this end of the, the business. Which every entrepreneur who's listening right now or watching us is nodding their head <laughs> <laughs> they're they're laughing but not necessarily because it's funny it's right. because it's hard and they recognize what you're talking about yes speak to those people who are still sitting around their kitchen table i mean you've actually launched a successful business around this you're in the process of scaling up mm -hmm. and we can talk a little bit about that but before we get there what would you say to those people who are who are sketching things out on the back of an envelope right now, they've got expertise in something just mm -hmm. like you did. Mm -hmm. They're very good at it. What have you learned that you would pass on to those people who are maybe five or six years behind you? Yeah, um, that do it. I mean, the worst thing that's gonna happen is that it doesn't go anywhere. But if you don't ever try, then you don't ever know. And yeah, it's, it's gonna take, it takes a lot of grit. And I mean, there's been times when I've had meltdowns and <laughs> um, question like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. And then I have a friend who calls and is like, hey, can I grab some maple syrup? I'm, I'm having a, a panic attack. I'm low on, on Vermont sticky, <laughs> you know? So those are the times where I'm like, oh no, I'm, I'm okay, I'm gonna make it. Mm -hmm. um, so I would mm -hmm. say just, just do it. Just try it. Because mm -hmm. the knowledge is there just because you don't have it. You, just because you don't know how uh, accounting works uh, doesn't mean that you can't go find it. It's not a reason to, to not do your idea. Exactly. Or at least take it to the next level and, and let experts say, yeah, this could work. Mm -hmm. All yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's um, when I find something that I'm not good at, which is... <laughs> not hard to find. I always say, well, I'm good at other things. And I kind of joke with my friends about that <laughs> all the time. Um, and my dearest friends, if, if they ever, you know, if they, if they listen to this, they're going to know because we joke about it all the time. When a friend or my husband isn't doing great at something, I'm like, oh, that's okay. You're good at other things. And, you know, it's kind of unjust, but but it's not. It's also true. Yeah, that's like we a can't good all be good at everything. Mm -hmm. And you just so you just have to have like the broad sort of overview of a lot of things as a small business owner. Um, 
but you also have to be okay with not knowing everything and and knowing that you need help. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people approach small business and being an entrepreneur as a technical challenge. There's the technical challenge of, okay, how do you turn raw maple sap into a product that can be sold? There's the technical challenge of what bottle to put it in and how to transport that and market it and put it on the shelf, all of those things. One thing that we forget, though, and I think is what you're talking about, is that it's also an emotional and a psychological challenge. Absolutely. And so here's the question for you in that. Where do you find, where do you go for um, support in order to maintain sort of the fortitude that it takes to get up every day and say, I'm not crazy. Um, I'm not about to lose everything. This is going to work. One step, one foot in front of the other, one step forward. What works for you? I lean on friends, you Mm -hmm. know, like when I'm questioning what I'm doing with my products or I need product testing, which not hard to find those friends, but um, to get (laughs) honest feedback is important to me. And so I, I definitely lean on my friends for that. So if there's an overall lesson in that, it's don't try to do it alone. Enlist a, a group of people who, from everybody from experts who can tell you that no, your idea has these holes in it, uh, just to people who will listen to you when you're, when you're <laughs> having a meltdown, as you say. Yeah. So I would say, like, being an entrepreneur, for me so far, there's times where I feel like I'm on this island and I'm just kind of floating out there and nobody like is bringing me a raft or mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. you know I'm kind of figuring it out and maybe I could try to swim somewhere but I don't know if that's going to help right so mm-hmm. there's times when I feel kind of alone in alone in trying to figure out how to move forward i mean we live in a small isolated community so i'm not i don't have a big support network um in a food-based industry community, such as like Boulder. You know, Boulder has a big food, natural food-based community. Um, so at times I do feel isolated, and I would say that it's. I think it's normal to feel like you're doing something by yourself or, you know, like mm-hmm. you don't have that support. But if you can zoom out, and this is what I have to tell myself when I do have those, like, moments, if I can zoom out, and see the bigger picture, I'm actually just standing on like a little lily pad, right? And all I have to do is take a step over and talk to my friends. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it's all a matter of perspective and don't forget to zoom out and know that there are people mm-hmm. with expertise and knowledge in whatever department you need help with. And that's good advice because um, entrepreneurism is scary. And I would say a a fair number of people who fail to follow through on their dreams, it's because the the fear is just that intense. And so I appreciate you sharing that perspective. So you've got a cadre of loyal customers, people Mm -hmm. who love your products well, and I would say that you entrapped by (laughs) providing it for free. Your dad was complicit in this whole conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Um, and now they're now they're hooked. Now they're going to keep coming back and buying your products. But you're ready to scale up and reach people who don't know you, who've never um, been there when your dad pulls up with a pickup. Mm-hmm. What are the obstacles that you have identified that stand between you and succeeding at that? Yeah, this is um, this is where the industry still is a mystery to some degree. How do you get this in, like, a, even a regional chain mm-hmm. without – because right now I'm literally bringing and dropping off every case of maple syrup to wherever it's going, <laughs> which is not sustainable, right? Like, No, but yeah. um, I'm shaking my head because I think uh, how many people have started there. Mm-hmm. Uh, whatever it is that you're making, uh, it's it's – being carried around in the trunk of your car to begin with. Yep, that's exactly what it's doing. And and making that leap from the trunk of your car to uh, uh, organized system. 
Are you finding any insights that you um, can point to and say, oh, okay, okay, here's how it works? Yeah, um, certainly. I've, I've found like how it works, and then it's figuring out how it works financially because everyone takes their cut. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you go from like this niche, um, really small business where you're carrying it around in the trunk of your car, um, you know, slinging it here and there, slinging the <laughs> sticky. Um, <laughs> but to take that to um, like a, a distribution company, they take a huge cut. And to make that financially feasible, you could imagine it means scaling, right? It means mm-hmm. like you have to have way more units. So you're you're losing a lot of margin. It's finding the balance of at what point do I not have like the time, the energy, the equipment to bottle and distribute myself mm-hmm. and then reach out and have a co-packer package that and then a distributor that will bring that and then you pay you have to like pay these other people that are basically working for you to get your product on the shelf at these stores and you put them on retainer like, <laughs> I mean there's so many little nuances to it right that's so. why this is not for cowards <laughs> well I love Vermont sticky thanks Alan. been putting it in my coffee <laughs> Uh, I love the names, uh, tree juice, and uh, and what what did you say? Sticky boost. S- sticky boost. <laughs> these <laughs> these are wonderful. Thanks. Wish you the best of luck, and oh. thanks for for sharing your journey with us. Thank you so much for having me here with you, yeah. Alan. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for another great conversation on Think Radio presents Think Business. Mm-hmm.